My name is Sandy Barr. Uh, I run a local user group called Omaha Coding Women. We're looking for more organizers. If anybody's interested in getting involved, we're an inclusive organization, so anyone is welcome. I work for a company called Avature. I'm a software engineer there, and I fell into using MongoDB for a project that we started on this summer called Spacebook. Spacebook uh, is a social network for satellites. So we're, we're going to be exploring schema design for a social network in this talk. Um, you typically maybe, maybe would use a graph DB for, for a social network, but one of the, some of the reasons that you might choose uh, MongoDB is for fast prototyping, uh, lazy schema migration, ease of scaling. For our particular needs, um, we are building a mock backend for our application, so we needed something to prototype in. So our application backend is run in, in Node. Express.js is the um, platform, and we use a package called Mongoose for object modeling. And it's, Mongoose is a schema-based package for Node that essentially works like an ORM, like you would think of Hibernate or Active Record. Um, it gives MongoDB access to MongoDB commands for create, read, update, delete. And it, it includes built-in typecasting and validation and other niceties. So it's pretty easy to include Mongoose in your Node project. This is going to be a little bit of a code-heavy presentation, um, but I do have a, an example project. So that will come back up again in the URL. And these slides are available on um, this URL here as well if you guys want to review them. So using Mongoose in your Node project, first you um, npm install a mongoose with dash dash save because you don't want to have those orphan dependencies breaking the build. <laughs> um, and then you require mongoose in and quick, quick connect to your mongoose URL. So for this example application, I built a social network called FriendFace. Join the herd! <laughs> It's a directed social graph, so users can follow other users and you don't have to follow them back, similar to Twitter or uh, Google+. So for our, our purposes, we wanted to minimize the number of documents that must be loaded in order to display the pages. Um, so in Mongo, it's not like a traditional relational database. You want to design for your application's needs. So, for our purposes, we had two independent collections to store the user profile and um, post information, and then two dependent collections that cached the data for display on particular pages. We had to make some decisions about how to lay out our data. Um, in, in Mongo, if you're familiar with JSON, you can embed to your heart's content. Um, so you have to decide whether that suits your needs or whether or not you want to reference your data by ID. So the, some of the pros for embedding is you've got locality. So in, in Mongo, your, your data is stored, um, the document is stored in um, one place on disk. So it's, you're only more, never more than one seek away from reading your data if you embed it and, and you get the full set. Um, it simplifies the reads. So you can just look it up by ID. You don't have to you know, find and then populate your related data. Um, you reduce the round trips to the database. And Mongo doesn't support transactions. So you're um, updating a single document, and then users aren't getting dirty reads if um, you don't have to isolate those operations. So some of the cons um, to embedding is what if you only need to retrieve some of the elements of like an embedded array? Um, Mongo does support like an element match operation to return a single element of an embedded array, but not a, a group without aggregation and, and such like that. So um, another con is the size of your documents. If your lar documents are large and they grow, they might need to be moved to a new location on disk so they can be stored contiguously. Um, the larger your documents, the less of those documents will fit in RAM. So Mongo wants to cache your frequently asked, frequently queried documents. So you, you want to make sure that you maximize that cache wherever possible. And then um, not embedding, you'll have many to many relationships where you've got to retain redundant data. It gets to be 
a little bit complex and you've got to manage those kinds of transactions in your application. So this is where the code heavy part starts. Um, for, for our purposes, for friend face, um, like I said, it's a directed social graph. So users have herds similar to Google Plus's, um, Google Plus's circles. And they can add uh, various members into those herds. They can, they can tag members in multiple herds, say if they're trying to direct things towards certain audiences or what have you. Um, so we decided um, to store in the user schema their profile information as well as the people that are following these users and then an array of their herds. So as you can see, like this information is going to be available in the other users' documents that are following them. So this is a place for us to cache that. So when we're getting that user's page and we want to know what their followers are, we don't have to scan the whole collection to find out who follows them. And then additionally, so we reference the users that follow them by those user IDs. And we want to cache their first and last name because we're displaying that on the page. So Imagine that you know, that's going to complicate when somebody wants to change their name in all of the places that you're going to have to change it. So when you do duplicate data like this, you're going to want it to be data that doesn't change very often. Are those uh, types in the schema? Is that all Mongoose? Yes. Yes, so in Mongoose, um, and that, I'm coming to that, so the different types that are available to you, you, you lay them out. So in Mongo, um, you can have anything in your document. It's very flexible. You don't have to have the same kind of documents. But this is a, mo a data modeling. So this, you, you've got to lay out your schema. And then um, in places where you want to have flexibility, so this is what the posts look like. Um, so in the posts, we put who the post is by, um, what herds can see this post, the type of the post. And then this detail information gets you that flexibility where you can store different types of information within your documents. And for us, it's based on the type of, of, of update that they're doing. And then again, we're caching the user's first and last name, referencing them by ID to provide us a link to that full user document if they wanted to go check out that user's page. And then we decided to embed our comments. So um, again, back on embedding, you know, we kind of wanted to think about, well, we, wanted, we want to not have to go look up those comments and, and uh, this have what, what data we need available to display with as few round trips to the database as possible. So we decided to store all of our comments along with our posts. Now our posts schema is the system of record. So this contains all of the user's posts. So we're not going exactly to this schema to, to populate their news feeds and their walls. We have separate schemas for each user that contain the posts that are displayed on their wall. So we, we decided that we wanted to have a month worth of posts as the most recent posts on their wall. And then if we wanted subsequent, um, less recent data, we, we would conti continue to query for those subsequent documents. So this, this post in here is identical to the data that you saw in the other schema, but this allows us to cache that user's data and query one document to display that page. Oops. And then we have an identical schema for their newsfeed. So these, these posts are by other users that show up in that user's newsfeed. So we, again, it's identical to the wall. It's the same format, but it's the, the other data um, from other users. So when they go to their newsfeed, we can display them the most recent month of newsfeed posts from the other users that they follow. The different types that you have available to you, um, and BSON is short for binary JSON. It's the format that MongoDB uses to store data. Y you have your typical JavaScript types like string, number, date. Um, you have a buffer for binary data, booleans, mixed, which we've already talked about. 
Um, one of the things with using mixed is that Mongoose loses the ability for, uh, to track that changes have happened to your document. So you have to call a special method mark modified when you're using mixed data to let Mongoose know to save changes to that information. And then you get um, Mongo's object ID and all, all documents in Mongo have an object ID by default. Mongoose allows you to set your ID to a different type if you prefer, but I chose to go with the default. Um, in addition, we've already seen that you can embed arrays. So some of the things that Mongoose provides you along with the schema, there's a lot of niceties. There's uh, virtuals. So say, for example, I don't know if you, can you guys read this OK? Say, for example, you're frequently um, using a person's full name, and you want an easy way to go get that instead of always putting that space or however you're formatting. You know, names can get complicated. So you can use virtual getters and setters. So not only can you say, I want to be able to get their full name and this format, you can say, I want to set their first and last name from their full name. Additionally, Mongoose provides you methods and statics. So the difference between methods and statics is pretty simple. It's either you're working with an instance of a document or you want to call a static function on the schema that's available to you. I found methods and statics to be very useful for encapsulating query logic, for example. When you want to unfollow a user, remove them from one of your herds, um, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated update, and it can you know, make your code a little bit easier to read if you encapsulate that information, obviously. So this particular method one is a method because we're working with this document. This one, we can just give it some parameters and call this based on from static and give it those, and it, and it brings back those documents. Ah, keep going the wrong way. So in addition, um, you, you can have middleware like uh, pre that, that will run before you call the save operation. Um, one thing that's a little bit dangerous about using this middleware is that it only works on save. So if you're doing, um, like we saw previously on this slide, if you run an update directly into your model, you're not going to get this pre-middleware. So if you're trying to say, anytime I update my document, set an updated at date, then make sure that you're using the save operation rather than directly updating into your, into your schema. Um, I often see examples where they do update it at and create it at um, as, as methods that are, are set in the pre-method. But the um, created date is actually available from the default ID. So you can add that as a virtual. So different ways of, of approaching the things that are available to you. You can also add your indexes um, on the schema level. I'm not sure why you would do this in code other than just uh, for convenience during development. You don't want this to run during production. So you set the auto indexing to false. Otherwise, every time your application starts, you're going to rebuild your indexes. And Mongo gives you uh, an index on the ID, which is most frequently how you're accessing your documents. So. I know, for example, uh, there's, there's a product at Aventure that has not had to add any indexes into their, into their schemas yet. So like I said, um, you know, you've got access to those create, read, update, delete operations. So the ways that you go about those um, for creation, say you want to post this new user into front face. Um, this, is, this here is an express re request, and we're um, checking you know, what that information is off of the request, and building a user document, and then we just call save on that instance. So you know, if we get an error back, we either get a result or an error. So if we get a, an error back, we want to just go ahead and, and pass that off to an, our express error handler. Otherwise, um, we want to tell the 
response that we created that user and what the location of that resource is. There are several ways to read. Um, basically, if you want to get one document back or a list of documents. So find will return you an array of matching documents. Um, find by ID, it's just like the, it says, it returns a single document by that ID. And find one will return the first match. So say for example, we're, we're trying to find one where their occupation is head of Renum Industries. Well, Denim Renum, Renum was head before Douglas, so this is going to return our first match. So different ways to um, chain your queries for, for building them. You know, say if you have optional parameters, if you want to query by month, if you optionally want to limit the number of documents returned, you can use this chaining rather than giving find a callback directly and then eventually when you're ready execute your query. So you can also interchange this query builder syntax along with this JSON conditions um, in any way that, that you feel. In Mongoose 4 um, they do support promises but most of the most of the examples you're going to see out there is with callbacks, unfortunately, so it can make for some messy code. Now for updating, um, you can find and update a single document, or um, you can do so by um, your conditions based on, um, you know, here I could have used find by um, herd ID or you know, here I just pass it the ID. And your second um, parameter to this is the update that you're making directly to the database. Now, by default in Mongo, um, update the, in Mongoose, updates are set operations, um, not not like Mongo where you have to specify that set to only set certain fields within your document, so you don't end up with a document that only contains profile and age. To override that behavior, you set the overwrite is true option. You can also do an update with save. So you're working with an instance of a document, you queried it by ID, you want to make some changes to the document, and then you just save that instance. It knows that it already exists, and it just runs an update on it. And this is where you get all that middleware, validators, defaults. When you use save, this is the traditional method of using Mongoose. So as you can see, there are many, many ways to perform an update. Um, there's even an update instance method that I really didn't cover. So. You know, there's, there's lots of ways to go about it, but you want to be careful with what your methods are. Say you're working in a team environment, you know, none of us codes on an island. Um, so when uh, you plan to use the, you know, the middleware and the validators and such things, you know, talk with your teams about your strategies. Sorry, that was this slide. <laughs> So yeah, like I said, um, values are cast to their types, but you don't get all the niceties when you directly update the records, which makes sense when you think about it. But if you're, you know, if you're just going along trying to figure out how to update a document and not thinking that somebody else wanted that data validated, default set, what have you, you're not going to get it. Um, so models then have a static remove method, uh, allowing removal of all the documents that match a given collection. Um, you can remove again by ID, you can remove by a condition, or you can just give it um, using this, this condition in JSON format. It's similarly to the query chaining um, with, you know, you can give it um, just the conditions and then call exec later. Um, you can work with that query and chain on, you know, where conditions and what have you. Or 
Or you can delete by instance. Say you found a record and you wanted it to remove it. Um, one of the reasons I chose to do this is because when um, you use the remove method, there's no result. So you actually don't get any feedback about what happened to your data. So I wanted to make sure that it was actually a record here so I could tell them, hey, that user doesn't exist for a four, or I could go ahead and delete it and say it was OK. So that was all I have. Any questions?